This is a going back, remembering UGA interview with Claude McBride, conducted by Fran Lane on April 26, 2007. Today, we're at the University of Georgia Visitor Center in the Four Towers Building on College Station Road in Athens, Georgia. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for talking with us today, Claude. My pleasure. Let's start at the beginning. Please tell us a little bit about your early life. I think you're a South Georgia boy, is that right? Well, Columbus sort of, we called it Middle Georgia. But um, I grew up on a farm outside of um, Columbus, Georgia. And um, when I was eight years old, the uh, government decided to expand Fort Benning and they took in all of our property and the neighboring farms and it became part of Fort Benning which is now the Sand Hill area of Fort Benning. Our family cemetery is still out there, the old thing. And so then we moved in Columbus, which was probably the greatest thing that ever happened to me because The urban I would center have, of Columbus. <laughs> yeah, I would have ended up hoeing and picking cotton probably the rest of my life. But we moved into Columbus and I went to schools there and then you came to the university. Who, tell us who was an early influence on your life. Please. Well, my first and second grade teachers were early, besides my parents, of course, um, the Pickett sisters. And um, one taught first grade and one taught second and third. And uh, I had both of them, and they were just wonderful, very encouraging. and. Uh, challenged you and taught you, you could, what you could become and everything. So they were great. And then in high school, I had a number of couple of real champions who were an inspiration. Well, now, that, was that when you decided the University of Georgia was the place to go? Or? Oh, I decided that when I was, I think, uh, as that was predestined or something. All my life, I always wanted, I remember um, when I was uh, nine, I was playing halfback down in the pasture. It was Charlie Trippy, you know. And, Had that 62 uh, on your shirt. Yeah, well, we were all, I was always going to University of Georgia, the only college there was. I would sit up with my father. I remember night game at Kentucky and we'd stay up listening to that and everything with him. But I, um, Georgia was where I was always going to come. And then Miss Patton, my high school um, journalism teacher, she taught English and journalism. And um, she was a great inspiration and um, encouraged me in journalism. And of course, the place to go was Georgia. University. And my first visit ever to Athens was with our high school newspaper staff to the GSPA. Right. I think I went to that one, Claude. <laughs> we can be elderly together. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> um, you got here, reached the campus 1949. 17 years old, I arrived uh, at the bus station and um, my dorm assignment was Candler Hall, and uh, so I, there was no way I could take my foot locker and two suitcases, you know, so I checked the foot locker and left it at the bus station and paid, got me a cab, and it cost me two dollars to go, which I found out the next morning was two blocks away, Candler Hall. Oh. But I toured Prince Avenue, Millage Avenue, <laughs> Lumpkin, everywhere, as he dropped off other people and then left me there at Candler Hall. Two dollars. Then you had to go back and get your foot locker. Yeah. Walked in there the next morning. <laughs> One of my new friends went with me and we brought it back. What did campus look like in 1949? Well, um, of course, Candler Hall is has been brushed up and polished and everything looks neat but that was our dorm there were four of us in a room about 15 by 15 had um two double deckers 
in there and we each had a um, sort of cabinet closet and there was one large table with four chairs around if we had guests they sat on the bottom bed you know <laughs> but um, the campus looked old campus of course looked as it looks now uh, thank goodness um, but um, you had North Campus and all my classes were there you know journalism building Park Hall and uh, Ball and the rest but um, South Campus Ag Hill was something that was removed um, we had the big track area where ROTC drilled and that's where the Student Learning Center is now and we had Old Woodruff Hall there and um, the along Lumpkin were large frame houses pretty much except for the uh, cafe and the law dormitory which is now the K house and the YMCA mm -hmm. but um, that whole area was just houses and um, well, those Lumpkin. boarding houses well, mm -hmm. a lot of some of them yeah rented rooms because they were so large and most of the people's families were gone we had a cleaner stand at the corner mm -hmm. uh, across from the track and uh, the greasy V uh, <laughs> donut shop going up the hill and other residences going up to the top of campus uh, where everybody hitchhiked. And I guess after Connor Hall on South Campus it was pretty much uh, pasture it, land and, and barns. Yeah, well and they had uh, some army barracks parked up where the Georgia Center is now and also back over where the College of Education is for marriage students. <coughs> the prefabs, and, uh, the prefabs, and the poultry setup was over there near where the um, center is. Myers was not built, and um, so the science center was mm -hmm. not there. And it was just from Candler Hall to the stadium was woods, and uh, then you had the home ec school, Dawson Hall in hard way in a couple of those buildings for that That's about it. How many students would you say were on campus when you started in 49? I think it was 44,200 something. We had um, the last of the, when my freshman year, they were about juniors then, the majority of them, but GIs who had come back on a um, GI Bill mm -hmm. and so we had a lot of those older students. Ma some married over in the prefab, yeah. living in the prefab. And they would take all afternoon classes and they would play poker and drink and <laughs> smoke, you know, all night. And I, I had an eight o'clock class. But you, so you had to behave? Yeah. I, I'm but sure. I could, you know, it's hard to sleep in there with that and um, John Cox finally I would go to sleep in his English class, and <laughs> he finally advised me to move. <laughs> John Cox, who later was the uh, head of things over in Memorial Hall yeah. when it was student mm -hmm. activities. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And you uh, followed a program in journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, that was your chosen major. Yeah, and took a lot of other things that I was interested in and everything. And I joined everything. Um, that was sort of my nature, to guess. But um, if they were having tryouts for a play, I did that. I worked on the red and black. I worked in the library. Uh, if they were having campus election, I ran for office or whatever. And um, I was freshman class president for the GOP. Great. Which was the independent. Uh, organization on campus. Right. Talk a little bit party. about the way I know at some point it was it, it was Greek and, and independent and that's the way mm -hmm. the parties ran and yeah what yeah. was the Student Government Association like was it? Um, we didn't have one as such um, that um, 
We had the um, IFC, the Greek thing, and then the GOP, and we would have um, maybe student committees or some mm -hmm. sort of thing with people from both um, who would go. I remember I was on the um, Georgia, Georgia Tech Better Relations Committee mm -hmm. after they came You didn't over. help that any though. <laughs> <laughs> after they came over and tried to chop down our cha chapel bell yeah. with an ax and um, some of our students retaliated by going over and breaking a vending machine. They said it was our students. So um, Dean Tate and the president at Tech got together and we had students from each campus met and talked about things we could do. Didn't do any good or make any <laughs> difference. But it well, was fun. You also were in the band and you were a cheerleader for mm -hmm. three years. Mm -hmm. Talk about well, that. Well, <clears throat> I wanted to go to the out of town games like Florida and the others and you couldn't be cheerleader as a freshman because they were elected the spring before. So uh, I joined the band. I had had some experience. I played bass drum in high school because it was there and <laughs> I did that. And so I played, joined the band and um, my freshman year I was in the band and traveled to what out of town games we went to like Columbus and Florida and all. And then I went out for cheerleading in the spring and the rest of the time I was cheerleader. Well now yeah, cheerleaders in those days didn't do what the cheerleaders now do, right? They have gotten a little bit more gymnastic. Um, well we built pyramids and okay. things, but we also led the students in yells. I mean, we had classic yells, you know. And everybody and knew what the words were. And, and they would yell, G E O R G I A, that and um, some of the others, and we would build pyramids, you know, and dance while the um, band played. Usually, jitterbug. What you fun! Know. <laughs> Sounds like great fun. Yeah. Um, you lived in Candler Hall. How long did you live there? Your entire time in school? No, I lived there my freshman year, and then I moved to Joe Brown, and. Um, I, end, I lived in three different dorms during my university experience. I ended up at Clark Howell. I hope you got to have a room with fewer than four people in it. Did you do I that? I did. Good mm -hmm. for you. That's a, that's a good thing. What, what did you do for a date, Claude, if you took a girl out? Oh, well, you would go eat if she had the money. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Where no, did you a go? A lot of it was Dutch. Oh, we went to, to really go out, we went to um, the Old South, which was located down across from the bus station, Tony's, mm -hmm. which was a nice okay. restaurant um, uptown. Now the those were big days. Huh? Those were big, those were fancy days. Yeah, right? and then Snack Shack, which was down where the present Holiday Inn Express is, which was real neat. We went there real often. But um, also, I hung out because I lived at Joe Brown at the BSU, which was the Baptist mm -hmm. Student Center, uh, right across the street. And it'd be, you know, sitting in the room or whatever, and there were always people there. So I spent a lot of time over there, which sort of passed for a day. Or we would go to movies <coughs> if we had a friend who had a car we go and I did have one roommate who had a car and um, we would go to a drive-in mm -hmm. Alps out where St. Mary's and yeah, right up Baxter Street is now yeah uh, we would go out to Uppies, the Posses um, um, now that was out in the country then yeah, practically wasn't it way out the Atlanta Highway yeah. but had good barbecue talk a little bit about some of the traditions of the time I know I feel like we've lost some of those, Claude. I know. Well, we have we have some of them, but they aren't as um, strong. We did have hazing, um, both in the dorms and in the various organization. Um, 
but um, that, you know, is passe. And things like walking under the arch <coughs> was really taken seriously. Uh, all of the freshmen wore rat caps, and men and women. And we had to have to hell with tech on the back. And one of the requirements at Candler Hall was that we had to steal a tech rat cap before the end of fall semester. <clears throat> in the end, and I got mine at the George George Tech game that year in Atlanta. So um, just snatched it off somebody's head. Yeah, I had to <laughs> steal it and go, and all the time holding yours because they were trying to take they were your trying to get your rat cap. You know, go. Uh, that was a lot of fun. We had the shirt tail parade. I'm talking about things that I was introduced to immediately as a freshman. And that was the first big pep rally of the year, for the first home game. And um, we would all meet, we knew of course, and we would get fancy underwear, uh, have a swimsuit, you know, with those over. And then at the end of the pep rally, usually with a bonfire down on the track, uh, they would yell out, freshmen, drop your pants. And we would all drop our pants or hang them around our neck and go up lump and uh, run up camp any way we could. And we had to go up college and townspeople would come out, you know, to see the spectacle <laughs> and everything. And we made our way out to Coordinate Campus where all the freshmen and sophomore women lived. And um, we had to run out there and uh, the first one to arrive got a kiss from their one, the girls and stuff, and then we had cake and cookies and uh, stuff for reception. Got together with all of the freshman girls and met them, and it was a good mixer. Oh, so in your but, boxers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, our, in our underwear, we go. But that was a. Um, um, big tradition, of course, the tradition of the chapel bell, and um, people would dress up more for the games, mm -hmm. and particularly the okay. seniors. And one thing I missed that I really liked was um, for church and for um, dress up occasions, the women students all wore hats, mm -hmm. and um, I liked that I don't know they just look so smart and uh, elegant and everything but they all wore them to church all the women and everything you weren't dressed I thought it was a maybe a religious belief or something but it wasn't but um, that in our dress was um, popular and um, um, peg leg pants zoot suit had a, enjoyed a short thing in there and the big thing was dirty white bucks. Mm -hmm. All of the um, guys had to wear white bucks if you were with If it. you were cool. Yeah, we had, but you had white bucks and the penny loafers mm -hmm. during our, our period. I remember seeing pictures of particularly the, the girls uh, hitchhiking yeah. on campus. All over, sure, we did. Not only just on campus, but we would hitchhike home to Columbus or uh, where we could. Hitchhiking was the way students got around. Mm -hmm. In fact, the little pagoda up on top of Ag Hill that's still there was where they waited for a pickup, you know, to come to main campus, those girls and boys too. And, it was it was a different time. It was a different time. It was all right, you know. People would stop and pick you up and take you to North Campus, and you get out, thank them, and that's um, how you got around. And mm -hmm. on any weekend, on Friday, on either of the highways going out, you see people all down holding signs about where they were going and everything. And it worked out pretty good. Talk a little bit about some of the faculty or the some of the administration, <coughs> some of the folks that you remember who... Oh, we were walking among giants and didn't even know it at the mm -hmm. time. But um, we had 
looking back and its history has proven just the most remarkable faculty here. Uh, we had in the area of science Eugene Odom, um, uh, Professor Henderson who was called that, who were the first real scientists who began to form the initial organizations that now have just exploded. But we had Hubert Owens, you know, who became one of the leading um, archi landscape architects in the world. We had, um, we had, of course, the big three, uh, Hodgson and uh, Hugh Hodgson, who was just remarkable. And all of these great men, like he and Lamar Dodd, mm -hmm. who was probably the most renowned artist in the South, and his works now are recognized as um, such. Um, these people in those areas knew other people and brought them to campus. That's how Peabody uh, became a friend way back. Mm -hmm. Um, Holbrook, who was the father of our present museum, which is the Georgia Museum, real good friend of Lamar Dodds, and I think it was Hugh Hodson, who had come to know Robert Frost, the poet that they brought every spring here. Uh, we had um, Albert Say, whose textbook was used in most major colleges and universities. That was the political Federal science, Union, right. yeah. And uh, he had written something like 30 books. We had uh, Merton Coulter, who was recognized as the leading uh, historian of the South, um, who was married to his job all those mm -hmm. years. And his book, College Life in the Old South, is a classic that's still used um, in most, for most research having to do, it is a history of the University of Georgia, but as he points out, it's, um, all of the colleges were so similar in their beginning, and he just, he's so authentic and uh, scholarly, and yet his material is so readable. Mm -hmm. That's not the only thing he wrote, but that's probably the most uh, well-known thing he did. We had Dean Drury in journalism, um, who started out as a professor of journalism and developed the what became the Grady School, and then today is that great College of Mass Communication, as it did. I'll talk about him. Uh, maybe a, a little later. But we had <coughs> Hodgson brought in Byron Warner, who had um, sung in the Italian opera, uh, who taught in music school. And we had Leighton Ballou, who was head of the drama department, who was married to Despi Carlos, who was a brilliant pianist and gave concerts all over the country and in Europe while she taught here. Um, we had um, Dr. Parks uh, in English who was so well known and did so much the writing. There just so many of them who were really great and established the programs we had here. It's incredible uh, what we had at the University of Georgia and we didn't even know it. And those are just some of them, I'm sure. Uh, there are many others I should be remembering for what they've done. Who would you say was the greatest influence on you in well, terms of your, ex and, and it may not just be in a classroom, it might be. Well, among those teachers that I mentioned, it was probably Dean Drury, uh, because that was my major, and I had him uh, most. Um, he um, <laughs> he was what he developed was just so far beyond what anybody else was doing and very quietly he founded the Georgia Press Association the Georgia High School Scholastic Press Association 
the radio and TV um, thing, um, just all of these institutes, and including the Peabody Awards that we give. He, he started that program, founded it, and brought him Worth McDougall to head that up, whom we just lost, as you know, last week. Wonderful professor, radio and um, TV and added to his faculty and did all of these other great things. I had him for um, um, Journalism 101, of course, and I always remember him getting up with his yellow notes and looking them over and sitting around and he would go over and adjust the lights and come back and he said, we have to make sure Mr. Grady's spirit is satisfied, you know, before we continue. And somebody jokingly, I hope jokingly, anyway, said so they went up and looked at his notes and he had in them history of journalism. You know, he had written in ink, mentioned radio. <coughs> and then in ballpoint pen had written out to the side, mentioned TV. <laughs> you know, so he'd been using the, the same history. notes for 100 years. Yeah, the history of journalism. But um, he was an interesting person. <clears throat> well, there's some interesting. Uh, there's an interesting sidelight on on Dean Drury, which we might get to later. But let's let's talk a little bit more uh, in terms of your involvement in the extracurricular activities. Did you run into Dean Bill Tate? Oh yes, I was on his committee, the Better Relations Committee. But uh, I was also a cheerleader and in politics and Demosthenian and um, all this sort of thing. He judged, I think, freshman debate. And uh, me and my partner won freshman debate. And then I won sophomore declamation and the junior oration. I was real Gosh, lucky. Cloud. It had them won the Demosthenian Speaker's Key, which was real rare. But in addition to that, as my job at the library, 50 cents an hour, which was very helpful. And I worked um, at least three, maybe four hours a day. And uh, you think you end up weekend with five or six extra dollars to spend. You can take a day mm -hmm. to Tony's for that, and buy two meals and have a little bit for the tip. But uh, I went to one of my <laughs> duties at the library, I don't know how it was related, but I also did the campus mail, that is, North Campus. I would start at academic and go around, pick up everybody's mail, and go to the mail room, which was directly behind the uh, library. And all of us took about 30 minutes, you know. But I got in every office and would, uh, Got to know a lot meet, of folks that way. Yeah, meet uh -huh. all these folks and pick up their mail and run out because I did it for years and everybody knew me and so it was a good thing. A so I had known him just real well and um, while I was here and he was a, a great friend and we were involved but even more so when I came back to Athens uh, in 64 and um, during the um, our quote hippie sort of little uprising and campus uh, unrest I guess you would call it he, he just was so brilliant at working with people and handling them and particularly students and getting to know him was priceless. I taught, um, after I came back, a course at the Christian College, which was Disciples of Christ College across from Holiday Inn, mm -hmm. where students could take an elective and where their students took all of their base curriculum at the university and only took Bible-related or um, religion-related courses over there. But I walked into one semester to do my New Testament class, and there sat um, Dean Tate and Sue Fan Tate in my class, and so they took my 
series on the New Testament and just we were a gridiron together we were did other things he was always there and a good friend and we would sit together a lot I remember it um, Mr. Um, um, at the funeral of um, Senator Russell's brother who had lived, retired here and everything. He was there and uh, he said, um, I had meant to get to whatever his name was, maybe Bob, and uh, tell him, um, he got there and tell him that uh, uh, me and Dr. Wilson would be on pretty soon. And Dr. Wilson was the 90-something year old former head of pharmacy. And he lived to be 101, I oh, think. Oh, yes. Well, I would. He was 90, and I would go out to the doing visit, visiting at the nursing home, Heritage, and I would meet him driving in, <laughs> 90 years old, to visit 70-year-old, you know, <laughs> inhabitants of the uh, nursing home. He's an amazing character and a great man, Dr. Wilson. I, I know that you have a wonderful story about working at the Columbus Ledger and Choir. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Okay. That started when I went to do a summer internship there on the newspaper in uh, June of 53. And um, my beat they gave to me as a cub reporter because... Phoenix City because they never got anything over there. They hated us. They didn't tell me all of that. <laughs> but uh, they um, just told me, you know, be careful. They don't like us, and the police particularly, because the newspaper was always doing these exposés on the graft and corruption in Phoenix City. And I remember I was, drove up, light was red, and I stopped, and I had almost gone under it, and I looked, and um, the rearview mirror, and that was a police car, Phoenix City police car behind me, so I put it in reverse, backed up a little bit, and the light changed, and I took off, and whoomp, <laughs> backed right into <laughs> him. You know, I had not taken it out of reverse, reverse, and there I was in the Columbus Ledger Inquirer car, you know, and I stopped and got out and just laughing. But he was, this particular one just laughed at me and said, you didn't do anything going. So I went on. But you would go to the office and they wouldn't say, we don't have anything or nothing came. You can look at the blotter, or, you know. This would be the police this, station? At the police station of the sheriff's office. Um, those were the two places I'd call them and go back. And then one night, all of a sudden, I get a call at home to come in, you know. This is on a, I think, maybe a Sunday night or, yeah, about that. Um, and they tell me that the Attorney General, who had just been elected Attorney General, um, Patterson, Albert Patterson, a fellow from Phoenix City who ran on a cleanup campaign, had been elected Attorney General of the state, and he had been assassinated. Oh my gosh. Coming out of his office to his car right there. And um, the, um, so I had to go in and work, and that went and carried on so that I didn't come back to school. I mean, I stayed and worked over, and worked out with Dean Drew to take a course at, um, Georgia University of Georgia off campus center in Columbus, which is now Columbus College, uh, that next um, quarter. And um, I ended up then staying on the newspaper two years, and we won the Pulitzer Prize in 53 for meritorious public service because of our Phoenix City expose, which I was one of the team of reporters. What a, who did that? What a great opportunity! Yeah. being in the it's right place. It's called being in the right yeah. place at the right time. But there are just many, many stories related to that. That was Sin City uh, of the South. Was that the? Oh yeah, that was one. They so had it was fourteen billion dollar gambling 
industry going over there. And, uh, just prostitution. It was incredible. Baby selling, gambling, prostitution. Uh, 42 unsolved murders. Good grief. That, uh, how did you how did you get in there and and find that information out without getting your they appointed a um well immediately they declared martial law and sent in you know things so uh in our following this um uh, assassination we had so many leads you know to follow up and all of the unsolved murders and stuff and people started coming out of the mm -hmm. woodwork and the Blue Ribbon Grand Jury were calling them in and they were indicting people right and left, you know. And they sent in um, uh, lawyers from the state to try these various cases. And one of them was a young, um, recent Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Alabama named George Wallace. <coughs> whom I got to know, who um, later for politics and stuff really became a different person from the one I knew then as this attorney, De Graffin Reed, who later was um, a leader in um, Alabama because the solicitor of the county and the chief deputy sheriff were indicted for the murder and, and convicted that but there was so many stories uh, hinging around the involvement of getting information and mm -hmm. stuff and then I would do things like um, I uh, did a personal interview with uh, one of the prostitutes well known and uh, who had come up from Dothan looking for work and how she got recruited and how they got her own drugs and then from that into what she was doing and she had mothered three babies that had been sold by good grief. the doctor among them. Just human interest, I did a good bit of that because I was interested in it, how mm -hmm. this came to be and everything. And We did a, a lot of the crime reporting and investigative things. What an interesting fun. situation. Right. Well, now, Claude, did, 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 is that when you decided to go to seminary after seeing all the, the evildoers? <laughs> no. I, I already had planned to go to seminary after I finished college here. In fact, my very last year, I had a what we call part-time church mm -hmm. in uh, Louisville, Georgia which is between Columbus and Lumpkin, and uh, where my wife was from, by the way. And uh, we, once a month, I went down and preached. That's about what it amounted to, unless we had a funeral or something I had to go down for. But um, all the time I worked on the paper, I did that. And uh, we went to two Sundays, which is called halftime, two Sundays a month, and I did that until I went to seminary at 55. When did you know you wanted to be a minister? Uh, when I was a, I guess between my sophomore and junior years in college. Well, you had been a wonderful speaker, obviously, winning no. all those prizes, <laughs> so. I know. Well, I had uh, done, um, uh, done a lot of speaking from back in high school on and in college. But the speaking was, it was just something I had to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just knew in your heart that that's what you had to do, Oh, right? yeah. yeah. So from Louisville now, did you go to Calhoun next or Jacksonville Beach? From Louisville, I went to seminary. That's right. I'm sorry. And then while I was in seminary, I served the First Baptist Church of Henderson, Kentucky, mm -hmm. on the weekends as the associate pastor. It was a church with over 900 members. Big church. And I was the associate pastor and did the music and the youth. Good grief. When did you have time to go education. to school? education. <laughs> well, I just went down on Friday and did the youth 
usually had a youth thing. They sent it around a basketball game, or some other mm -hmm. something. And then I'd start having a children's choir on Saturday morning, youth choir on Saturday afternoon, and some functions Saturday night. And then the two church services. And then we practiced on the church choir. I met them on uh, uh, Saturday night or sometime after church on Sunday if we were preparing special cantata or something. They got their money's worth. Well, yeah, but that's the, well, it was a great experience because it was a large church. When I took the job, I um, found out that I was there a month and then the pastor, Dr. Talent, left. Um, to take a Holy Land tour would take a group of people and he was gone a month so I had everything oh, gosh. for my first month as um, he was just waiting for you to get there seminary and then the, I stayed there and when I graduated from seminary I went to Jacksonville Beach Florida and then as an associate doing the same thing and then to Calhoun as pastor and then from Calhoun here back here. You came back in 1964, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and, and you didn't start Millage Avenue Baptist Church, but it was a young church. Yeah, I was second pastor. Mm -hmm. What, uh, when you returned to Athens, Georgia in 1964, how had things changed? Oh my goodness, I couldn't, uh, couldn't believe, you know, how much had changed, but let me say, since I've been here, it yeah. has changed twice over. I would agree with from that. Then. But um, when I came back in 64, they had Myers Hall, they had um, a lot of new stuff was um, built. Um, they were talking about building a bookstore. They had built the Coliseum, mm -hmm. tore down Woodruff Hall, and were building the new CJ building mm -hmm. over there, and a psychology complex, uh, as far as buildings and things. But the town had grown so much, the number of people who were here. But we didn't have near the explosion of apartments and everything mm -hmm. in 64 that we have now. You know. Yeah. Well, now, you were at Millage Avenue Baptist for nearly 20 years, mm -hmm. is that right? Retired mm -hmm. in 1983. Mm -hmm. What made you want to come back to the University of Georgia? To well, work? I really never left it. Um, I, <laughs> while I was pastor of, at Millage Avenue, I was chaplain for the athletic department for the football team. And um, I started that in 69. Mm -hmm. And that led to other things all campus wide. You know, I was included uh, because, and introduced as chaplain and stuff because I did that. And like I did um, Dr. Coulter's funeral, mm -hmm. the eulogy and stuff, that even though he wasn't in my church, um, I did a lot of those chaplain things. So I was related to the university and active in the alumni. Um, and in fact, um, I am a member of the uh, Thalium Blackfriars mm -hmm. alumni, which is drama. And the, the ROTC military alumni I'm a member of the Red and Black <laughs> alumni group and a paying member of Cheers, which is the cheerleader alumni group. Um, journalism, Grady School alumni, I'm active in that. And in the Men's Glee Club alumni. So counting the regular alumni association, I'm a member of seven so. University of Georgia alumni groups, and um, so we're lucky to have you. you no, keep, you're I keeping just, us all supported. I did that. And the Red Coat Band. Did I mention <laughs> no. that? No, that makes eight. Gosh, Claude. Uh, so you don't have time to have breakfast. Well, 
<laughs> go to all of them. I just have to send money to be a member of Freud. Well, Gordon Bradwell was head of alumni affairs at that time mm -hmm. when you came on, is that right? Yeah, he had just succeeded Ty Butler. And at the time, Gordon became director. I became a mm -hmm. associate director because um, I had um, completed the 30, 53 to 83 is 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, 30 years in the ministry. And then now I've retired with 20 years in the alumni, uh, with the Alumni Association. And I'm still a consultant with them. And uh, I'm, they have a full-time chaplain in athletic department who works with the football team. But I'm chaplain emeritus. I have that title. So I enjoy that. They let you come and pray when it's a really big <laughs> game, right? No. <laughs> I, I'm there as a resource uh, if I'm needed. But um, it was sort of natural that I do that. I had 30 years and um, had been at Millage Avenue about 20 years, and I figured it was time they heard somebody else, um, you know, for the good of right. the church and everything else to go. And I felt um, that this is what I should do, and so I was approached, the opportunity was there, and I did that, and um, then spent the 20 some years there in alumni. Part relations. of your part of your responsibility was the travel program. Talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, that grew to be um, my major responsibility because um, I was doing the travel program. Gordon had done this, and then he left uh, after a few years, um, and the new administration or structure did not, you know, was not interested in the travel program, you know, to go with such. So I took it on with my other, other duties like the contingent groups in the state and things like that. And the travel program just grew. Um, amazingly from two or three or four trips and because people who traveled still wanted to travel and we had to offer additional trips mm -hmm. where they hadn't been plus repeat the old favorites you know to Europe, Hawaii or whatever that people who want to travel had never been and so it kept going and we ended up when I retired the year before, we had had uh, 700, over 700 participants Whew. in about 18 or 20 programs. Oh and so it became full time. And I did a lot of extra thing too to make it more full time. I would do a little um, bow on everybody who mm -hmm. traveled and share it so that you would know something about everybody in the oh, trip yeah. that you, you, know, you were traveling with. And um, also would do research, make reading lists and things on where we were going, places mm -hmm. to see and do some facts. So. You've been, ha is there anywhere you've not been? Maybe yeah, that's the way to ask. There are places I haven't been. But I was um, reviewing, just doing a thing on a whole list of uh, countries. And I have, um, I visited 97 countries. Goodness. And um, that's sort of enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's time to be at home. So. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's fabulous. No, I hear um, heads from friends that they're talking about a trip. They were planning leaving on. I was saying, oh, that's wonderful. I remember that. Great memories from being there. And um, then after I left, I said, I'm so glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> don't you know? have to do that again. <laughs> well, now I know you also have now. Yeah. You have the Greatest Generation uh, program and the Legacy program, right? And you do yeah, reunions. Those, uh, actually, those um, I do for our alumni e-newsletter mm -hmm. thing we do, which is a series on um, veterans, 
from World War II that I started that's still going and um, I do one every month and then legacies, always looking for them to share with other alumni, families and uh, who for several generations mm -hmm. have been in Georgia to go and um, part of that's part of what I do and then I do the um, 50th reunion every year for the reunion class who's celebrating its 50th reunion which is um, a lot of fun and get to know and work with those people and I also uh, work with and the liaison work with UGARO, which is our University of Georgia Retirees mm -hmm. Association that I helped establish when I was um, in um, this part of my alumni that I was doing back then. And uh, President Knapp, when he was president, wanted to know what was being done for alumni and did a survey, appointed a task force, and they found out that the Mainly the only thing being done for <laughs> retirees at the university was we would sponsor uh, once a year an event for the retirees, call it the, you know, and a retirees mm -hmm. banquet or whatever. And uh, since we were the only ones doing that, he asked uh, me and Professor Joe Hammond to set about doing something about mm -hmm. organizing. So we got together key retired faculty and others and established UGARA, which is well and strong yeah. and going well. It's pleased with the turnout for our session mm -hmm. recently. Let's talk about your family a little bit. You had indicated that you met Gail when you were ministering at Louvale. Talk yeah. a little bit about Gail. She was um, a Methodist, but she was from Louisville, and of course, on our Sunday, they all the Methodists came to our church anyway, as we did. <laughs> Took turns. There's, yeah, and uh, she's a wonderful person. She's uh, really inspired by her high school uh, teachers, and she was an excellent student and won all of the student awards at her Stewart County School and went to Auburn and got her uh, basic degree and I always kid her and tell her that after she went to Auburn she had to go back to school and get an <laughs> education. But then she got a master's from Georgia and also her six year. Uh, taught in the, I know in the Clark years. County School for a number of years. She taught and she was a dedicated uh, teacher um, she, in fact, one year she was um, Teacher of the Year, elected by her peers or something, and she was a star teacher because her student who won the state selected yeah, wow. her as his star teacher. And then she was a presidential teacher because uh, she had a student who was one of the few selected as presidential um, scholar and uh, who went on That's to great. Harvard and so she had to go to Washington and everything nice. was recognized. And there. So she won the three. Um, I remember sitting up there with Stan and she led in. They always have the teacher of the year and the star teacher or whatever lead out. One of the lines when they have the high school graduation in the Coliseum and so they stuck her out in the middle. <laughs> So she was all of that. <laughs> she started coming in, and my son uh, remarked, "Our triple crown winner." <laughs> you know, but uh, she um, was dedicated to. She taught and retired, and then Liz Murphy, who was then the director of women's athletics at the university, saw that in the paper and said, "I need you. You know, come and help with us. You know, like." So she started part time work with the Athletic Association and with the Dean of, in the Women's Athletic Office, but then it spilled over so that she works um, with the um, counseling and um, high school records mm -hmm. and eligibility and housing. 
part time and loves that she does that. Keeps that her hand in. How you had known Gail there in Louisville? I want to know how you made the first date with Gail. What did you? Oh, uh, well, you know, she was a student at Auburn, and I was working on the paper, preaching down there on the Sundays, two Sundays a month. And so I got in touch with her at um, Auburn and asked her to be my day for the um, um, Pulitzer Prize winning banquet presentation thing. And <laughs> so she accepted and um, so she um, was my date for that and then afterwards it was not long before I went off to seminary but um, we would then I went over we took her to a movie Battle Cry or something I think was the name of that movie and um, we came back and then I would go down there to family functions and they, we would, we just sort of were a couple mm -hmm. after that, those two days. So that Pulitzer Prize sort of sealed it, huh? Well, yeah. It was yeah, a good thing day. in lots of <laughs> Right. And we have two um, children, Walt, who's on the faculty of the university, and uh, he works with Carl Vinson Institute, mm -hmm. and my daughter, Winter, who uh, teaches uh, public school locally. And you have some grandchildren. Tell us about five grandchildren. A lot of grandchildren. Yeah. Do you get a chance to do a lot of babysitting? Um, well, they're th almost beyond yeah. babysitting now. We just sort of uh, share now and then, but that's a good yes. thing. I hear grandchildren are great things. They are. They're a thing in mind. We're blessed. They're brilliant and beautiful. Oh, uh -huh. and you're not the least bit can't prejudiced. Believe their mind. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to some things. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Is, do you have a favorite University of Georgia memory? Um, a favorite Georgia memory of when I was here. Uh, gosh, there are so many. It would be uh, very difficult to choose one. Um, one would be uh, when I one sophomore declamation because there was some real keen competitors mm -hmm. in that thing and um, I had uh, it was real special because I had lost my father about two months before mm -hmm. and it sort of dedicated it to him and I remember at the time when I won that it was just so you know, just a thrill. Yeah, a thrilling thrill. and approving, and a thing like I did it for you, in which is sort of a um, minor thing. Um, another great thing, uh, I worked on the Red and Black, and I also worked on the George Cracker. Now tell us, what was the George Cracker? It was a magazine. It was a campus magazine okay. that we published once quarterly, which became defunct. I don't think it was because of me, <laughs> but it was later defunct. But we had a lot of fun with it. it we would um, collect poetry, student stuff, and all of that, and publish it. Jack Davis didn't draw cartoons for it, did no, he? No, he was gone. He wasn't around here at uh, <laughs> that time. I would have a great... Um, number of uh, football uh, memories, you know, when the rare occasion when we would upset someone uh, that we weren't expected to win. Uh, it was a great thing to be elected uh, cheerleader the first time. After that, you had to compete again but since you were already won, you were, mm -hmm. you had it up on everybody else. But I was the only non-fraternity person who won, truly. 
I bet you were a great yeah. cheerleader. No, I was loud. Well, and that school. counts. Yeah. That counts. Yeah. Do In you? fact, Dan McGill had me come to Wally Butt's office and do a cheer. Is that right? Yeah, hear how loud this guy is. And so I <laughs> fell forth. What about a favorite UGA tale, a story? Well, I'm telling him all the time. That should not be uh, very difficult. Some that I'm, when I could share uh, publicly. There yeah. are <laughs> so many little vignettes. I remember um, Byron Warner, uh, who directed the Men's League Club and had sung with the Italian opera, his own voice himself but we would be doing something very difficult like Palestrina and oh I remember when we were working on Oh Bone Jesus where we had to really do falsetta mm -hmm. to get the sound he wanted and he <laughs> and then and used an expletive that I won't repeat but it was Damn it, fellas, sing it like you mean it. You know, <laughs> oh, good Jesus, damn it, <laughs> sing it like you mean it. Uh, those all the time, and on the trips um, we took together, both um, Glee Club, band, cheerleader, um, wonderful, wonderful. Just good times. Mm -hmm. Good I, times. I agree yeah. with you. What accomplishment? in your full life, and you've had such wonderful experiences, and what accomplishment would you say was your, are you the most proud, of which, or two or three of which you are most proud? Um, I don't know, I think um, related um, to the university, has been the recognition I've received mm -hmm. um, from them, the appreciation and uh, the wonderful people with whom I've been associated in the events. Um, with church, I think it would be the completing of the new sanctuary while I was there and the dedication of that mm -hmm. building and to see um, how it um, continues the mission and outreach and uh, daring to be different, mm -hmm. you know, and I think really accomplishing some great things. And um, with um, my family, my children, I think we're just so blessed mm -hmm. and so many ways um, that um, all of these things I think coupled together uh, just just make life wonderful. Isn't it? I've been so blessed with at least two if not three um, careers, careers you know <laughs> really and truly that were wonderful opportunities and I sit around and talk to some people who's lives have been so boring and um, from my point of view I can't believe it but um, just just really been blessed with the opportunities and with the many many times that I've been in the right place at the right time. Well, well you must have been living right to do that though too. Let's get down to the nitty gritty now though. I know that there have been some interesting things uh, that have happened uh, on the, uh, connected with the university mm -hmm. and, and certainly one of those, and you mentioned Dean Drury earlier, there was yeah. a... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell that in a minute, but I just thought okay. um, the thing of campus politics, right. which is real interesting, which is always around and gruesome. The fact that goes with all the many wonderful, beautiful things we were a part of. When um, I was interviewing, when I became associate director, I was sitting there, and the receptionist and I were there. And she didn't know me a whole lot, about and I didn't know her or anything. And um, I'm waiting to go in to talk 
to the group and just all at once she said well which side are you on <laughs> oh my gosh now what is this about but thing but as it was there was um, some very opinion opinionated differences going on having to do with development and alumni relations that I knew nothing about you know so uh, I just said I'm neutral <laughs> say, ignorance is bliss sometimes right. <laughs> oh, okay but I thought that was so interesting of um, of so many things that go on yeah. around here it's not earth shattering or whatever but if um, anybody ever did anything about the politics and the how you work the system and everything I love that uh, which side are you on <laughs> you know? well you know a campus person? truly you know people who are outside have no idea uh -uh. Uh -uh. Of the in, all of the all, convoluted mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. going on and the way things happen, but and the complicated departments and stuff, and in spite of that, we worked through it and worked Somehow together and get it right. done. That's right. Um, the thing about Dean Drury, uh, one of the things that was such um, that shocked me, I was home. I guess Christmas holidays. What year was this, Claude? Nineteen. It had to be early. 50? Probably, yeah, I came in about 49, 19. so it would have probably been 50 about that. But um, my mother came in and threw the newspaper at me or something and um, said something like, your dean's been shot, and I didn't know what it was. And there on the front page of the Columbus newspaper was the fact that in Dean, Dean Drury, the distinguished Dean of the Journalism School at the University of Georgia had um, been shot by his wife, um, his strange wife, um, while visiting in the home of his secretary, you know, which sounded just, mm -hmm. you know, really, really terrible. As it um, turned out, um, he and his wife, a strange wife, had been sort of separated some 18 years. That I knew nothing about all of this and that he and um, his secretary, named Miriam, they later married, mm -hmm. um, were an item I did not know about. But um, the shock of that and everybody immediately having opinions mm -hmm. of what this is and what's going on and all. all. Well, I get back to school and of course that's the big issue here too is that thing going on and finally there's a trial and um, everything comes out and I think um, they had been separated a long time and his first wife had had some um, mental mm -hmm. problems with other things but sitting there as a student and um, knowing that you know I'm just I'm watching the door I don't want anybody <laughs> to come in <laughs> shooting at my teacher or my dean while I'm here and word got around we were not to go to the trial or that sort of thing and a lot of students did slipped in and set up stairs or whatever and would come back and tell us in addition what to what the paper was reporting um, what they were doing. But Dean Drury, um, you know, just stood up under that and with great dignity and everything. He continued to teach? Oh yes. he. Well now he was shot in the backside, right? Yeah. He was going over the back of the couch. He I was think. getting out of that. Yeah. And um, he um, didn't miss much class, I don't know, from thing going. Thing. I remember uh, one uh, something is when wife in courtroom, they would come back, and these were little ramblings we'd have that we'd been sleeping in separate beds all these years. And he would uh, just quip, well, you bought the beds, you know. <laughs> Is your idea and we would pass around all of that little information you know 
going around the classroom and was so excited and one or two people would say you shouldn't talk to well it's news it's what's going on and it's journalism it, yeah but it was um you can imagine the shock of the thing happening and then of all of the students and of us wanting to know everything and of most of the faculty in the school pretending it hadn't happened and um with Dean Drury, you know, it's life as usual going on. Same, but we weathered it and lived through it. And, and he I continued he for years. Through, yeah, yeah, with great dignity and got over the situation. Well, you know, based on the things that we see in the newspapers these days, uh -huh. now, that wouldn't have caused a, a, a trickle Ripple, uh, right, right. A, at all. Yeah. But, but I'm sure that in that day and age, and as you said, the dignified Dean of the School of Journalism, and, and it was very titillating, I guess. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Miss Drury is still alive. Yes, she is. Maybe somebody that we talked Ms. to. Miss Miriam so. is. She's real alive. <laughs> Don't ask her about that. I, I don't, don't believe I will. Anybody ever discusses No, I can't imagine. Anymore. She's a lovely person. Anything else that you would like to tell us or something that we need to say for posterity's sake? Oh, posterity. No, just that... Uh, uh, for those who don't know that what a wonderful grand place the University of Georgia is and with its rich tradition mm -hmm. and great foundation that's uh, we need I think to remember that that uh, everything that the many wonderful things that have been accomplished are because somebody else laid the foundation mm -hmm. and paid a price and these people were really, really dedicated, who worked day and night and didn't complain about hours and that sort of thing. Merton Coulter, as I uh, suggested, had no wife or family, so he was literally married to his job. And um, he uh, gave all, we just don't have that many people who give this much attention in time to Com what they the commitment professionally yeah. Yeah, the commitment. anymore. Uh, Bill would like to hear about Ugga burials. Did you did you uh, <coughs> preside over those? No, I was um, at one Ugga burial after they, you know, had moved. I was asked to come and have a prayer. Say a prayer. Indeed, and. Uh, only got one hate letter because of that. <sighs> the idea of praying. For a dog. Yeah. No He's a damn He's good dog. God's dog. gift. Yeah, that's <laughs> what it was. <laughs> and then one fellow objected to my saying that. I had carefully worded it as um, students so aptly call him damn good dog. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't believe a minister would say damn. And I thought you should just live one day in a minister's shoes. And yeah. As mm. Jimmy Carter pointed out, to think it's as bad as to say it. 